Good morning. Uh, my name is Richard Quartz. I'm a member of your alumni board here at the Terry College and uh, chairman of the Terry Third Thursday Task Force. Um, it's good to see you here. Um, if you haven't been to uh, the center yet, this is the uh, Terry College's Executive Education Center. We've got classrooms upstairs as well as downstairs. Um, normally, Dean Benson's here to join us, but this morning he's uh, participating in the second and final day of our Director's College, um, which is underway uh, downstairs. If you haven't heard of it, the Director's College is a, a corporate board uh, director education program that Terry conducts every year. Um, with the uh, National Association of Corporate Directors. It's uh, become very popular, and uh, we're sorry George is not here this morning, but hope uh, if you have any interest in that program, you'll uh, look on our website. <clears throat> A couple sponsor recognitions um, this morning uh, with the Atlanta Business Chronicle. We have Joel Welker. Joel, thank you for your, uh, your support. And uh, from Public Broadcasting, uh, for the first time in my memory, Harriet is not here to join us, but uh, we thank them for their support of Terry College. <clears throat> a couple uh, upcoming speaker events. Um, on July 20th, we'll uh, be hosting the Clean Air Campaign, um, and we have a panel uh, of young ladies that are in involved in that program. Ellen Mockett, who is Executive Director of the campaign, will moderate, and she'll be joined by uh, Leanne uh, Lorazis of Cox Enterprises, Grace Perry um, of Time Corporation, and Lisa Tobias of Turner Broadcasting. Um, August 17th, we'll have Allison Carl O'Kelly, who will be here to tell us about uh, her Atlanta startup venture. She's founder and CEO of Mom Corps, um, as well as a Terry grad. Uh, Mom Corps is a business service that matches professionals, mostly women, but Mr. Moms are inv uh, involved too in the fields of accounting, law, marketing, and information technologies. Uh, and this is kind of a neat program. Basically, if you're an at-home mom, you know, they kind of place you for two days a week, um, and it kind of saves the employer and the, uh, the moms the brain damage of being a, a full-time employee, so it's kind of a neat program. Uh, in September, Tom Glenn, another Terry graduate, will be uh, here. He's the chairman of Ace Hardware. Um, you can register for all of these events online, so I uh, hope you will uh, you plan on join us, joining us then. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker this morning, A.J. Robinson. A.J. is president of Central Atlanta Progress the Atlanta down uh, and the Atlanta Downtown Improvement District. He manages the overall strategy of both organizations, which are de designed to make downtown Atlanta a more livable, vi vibrant, and diverse community. Before he became president of Central Atlanta Progress, A.J. was president of Portman Holdings Real Estate Company. During his 22-year career with Portman, he managed all aspects of the real estate development process. In Atlanta, those developments, uh, which you'll all recognize, include SunTrust Plaza, America's Mart, the Atlanta uh, Decorative, Decorative Arts Center. And actually, uh, we were just talking uh, back in 91, A.J., is that right? He uh, opened the first non-Chinese hotel in uh, Shanghai, which I was fortunate enough to visit back in January, and it's uh, the Portman Ritz-Carlton, which is pretty impressive. Um, AJ's a, a Knoxville, Tennessee uh, native. Uh, he did his undergraduate work at Emory. He went to Harvard, where he earned an MBA in 1980. He and his wife, Nicole, live here in Atlanta with their three children. Um, and not surprisingly, AJ has quite a list of civic involvements. I'm not going to go through all of them, but um, he serves on the board of directors of the America's Mart, uh, the Alliance Theater, uh, the Atlanta v Visitors and Convention Bureau, uh, the American Israeli Chamber of Commerce, the World Trade Club of Atlanta, Emory Board of Visitors, and the Atlanta Jewish Federation, just to name a few. But uh, he's here to talk to us this morning about uh, Central Atlanta progress and, and what's going on in downtown. Please welcome uh, AJ. Thanks, Richard, and good morning, everyone. I can probably the only speaker you've had that could stand up here and say that we've, my college has never lost the University of Georgia in football. Uh, so that's one of the real benefits of having gone to Emory, that we, we've never lost to Georgia. Uh, surprisingly enough, I'm going to talk about downtown this morning. For those of you who are expecting another kind of speech, uh, 
but first, I, I want to give you a little introduction um, about our organization, uh, what, what's maybe a snapshot of what's going on downtown, why it's going on, why, why it's important. And uh, I hope to leave a lot of time for questions. I find that uh, um, many folks are just interested in things that, uh, regarding the city, whether it be politics or um, in the ABC, you've got articles about the Beltline as a hot topic. So I'll be glad to try to field any questions um, that I may. Uh, a little bit about Central Atlanta Progress. So a lot of people don't know that it was actually created in 1941. Uh, is it's a private not-for-profit corporation that strives to create a strategic, strategic focus and robust economic climate for downtown Atlanta. CAP is funded through memberships of businesses, institutions, foundations, plus program and management fees. Our current chairman is Phil Kent, the CEO of Turner Broadcasting System. Now, the Atlanta Downtown Improvement District, or the ADID, was founded in 1995, right? right before the Olympics. Uh, and it was founded by CAP, and it's a pro public-private partnership whose goal is to create a livable environment for downtown Atlanta. The ADID is funded through a community improvement uh, district, which private property owners pay a special tax assessment to actually tax themselves. Uh, you see the, the result of which is the 65-member ambassador force that uh, walks around downtown, and we also have a 13-member clean team uh, that's funded through this special assessment. And now in the last couple of years, we've actually been getting into the capital business, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a few moments. The current chairman of the ADID is Craig Jones. He's the executive vice president of Cousins Properties. Now together, both of these organizations focus on current and critical issues that drive downtown's growth, its, its livability, its viability. Now imagine with me for a moment, just for a moment, the kind of downtown Atlanta that you want, uh, that you want not for yourself but for your children and your children's children. Imagine a downtown with great transportation access, with a friendlier and more visually appealing sidewalk environment. Imagine a downtown with more to do, arts, entertainment, attractions, retail, believe it or not, restaurants, and a downtown that is economically attractive uh, and works to attract new businesses with a well thought out growth strategy. Imagine a downtown that manages its public spaces, whether it's, a vin whether it's vending, special events, or something as simple as how a park is used. Lastly, imagine a downtown that preserves its historic buildings and nurtures its neighborhoods to grow and attract new residents to call it home. Well, today, I'd like to tell you that many of the things that you're imagining either are on our downtown drawing boards, they're either coming out of the ground, or they're nearly completed. And most folks haven't yet seen it. As we all know, customers make a market. And in downtown, when we talk of customers, we call them residents, employees, students, sports fans, conventioneers, visitors, and the like. And let me give you some numbers about what these customers represent. In terms of residents, we currently have about 25,000 people in a one-mile radius of Peachtree and Ellis Street. And if you know downtown, that's where the uh, Ritz-Carlton is, Peachtree and Ellis. That number of 25,000 is probably moving to between 30 and 36,000 just in the next 12 months. Another 8,000 housing units are expected in a year or so. We have on a daily basis almost 150,000 employees. We're still the largest employee market in the city of Atlanta, in the metro area. We have about 50,000 students a day. Uh, the ma majority of which attend either Georgia State or Georgia Tech. Sports fans and visitors, we have millions visit downtown's 12 major sporting and entertainment venues. And over 2 million folks have already visited Ralph and Norton and all their friends at the Georgia Aquarium. And uh, many of you, I'm sure, have not even yet been to the aquarium. I think everybody's been at least three times. but. Uh, the aquarium had projected to do just about two million people, and they've already done two million people in the first six months, two million people in the year. So 
uh, they're, they're now just into the busy season or the summer season. So I think those numbers are going to be three and a half million plus. Um, and next year, next spring, you'll see probably another million plus when the new world of Coca-Cola opens uh, on Centennial Park. Now, over the past year, in addition to that, we've had a string of new and important announcements in the, in the downtown community, almost to the point of matching uh, the new branding tag every day is an, is an opening day. And let me just give you a few of those. And, and actually, you got have maps, and I'd like to point out some of those if I can. Uh, David Marvin of the Legacy Group, Legacy Properties, re renovated the historic Glen Hotel, which is just here on the corner of uh, Marietta and Centennial Olympic Park. If I'm off here, maybe right there. Uh, Jim Borders is here, the Novair Group has sold, Jim, 50 prints in, almost 50% of its units in the first phase of the 12 project up here. Uh, the first phase is five, over 500 units, has sold about 50% in, in the first 30 days of construction. And uh, that project won't be finished till the middle of 07, uh, but that's a terribly exciting project for downtown in total about 1,000 units in a, in a 12 hotel. The Southern Company right across the street has opened its, its doors and uh, we're expecting a new, uh, a, a brand new restaurant in this building. That may not sound like much, but uh, we have a collection of new restaurants coming here and in Jim's project and around downtown. A lot of people have always complained that we don't have enough restaurants. Uh, the theatrical outfit uh, has opened the, um, the Balzer Theater on uh, Lucky Street. Uh, right in here, uh, opened last year and is doing uh, great. And then two projects you haven't heard too much about, but the renovation of Capital Homes, which is down here, and the renovation of Techwood Homes, which is right here, uh, sorry, Grady Homes, which is right here in the Grady Curve. These two projects are massive. Uh, they're being done by the Atlanta Housing Authority, and this whole eastern flank of downtown on the eastern side of the connector is, is really changing, much like Techwood Homes, which changed prior to the Olympics. Uh, the long-awaited rebirth of the Weinkauf Hotel uh, has begun, and that's right in here. Now it's under construction. It's now called the Ellis Hotel, a boutique hotel. And then a few weeks ago, we broke ground on Sweet Auburn Renaissance Village. Um, the Integral Group, it's a housing, retail, and commercial complex that is going to change the whole nature of this uh, side of downtown, as is 2,000 new units of housing for Georgia State University, which is under construction. And that's a very interesting, Georgia State's a big part of the, of the downtown community, and uh, many folks don't realize that uh, I think it's next year, next fall, uh, fall of 07, the Georgia State would require students to live on campus. Now, those of you who have any association with Georgia State recognize that over the years, it's been this, uh, probably the poster child of a commuter school, but no, no more. And uh, uh, we've got students living here, we have students living over here, and uh, these, uh, the, the Georgia State dorms on the Georgia Tech campus that you see in the, in the curve and the connector, uh, most likely are not gonna be Georgia State in the long term. Most of those students in those dorms are gonna move down here on the campus somewhere. So um, there's a lot going on with Georgia State. And then last week, uh, we broke ground on another legacy project here in the shadows of the, of the aquarium. Uh, legacy is building a, a new Hilton Garden Hotel with a lot of retail on the bottom. Uh, an interesting new project. Much of why we're getting all this development is um, driven by the fact that all of this area that you see pretty much in the central core here is now, uh, uh, now designated as a tax allocation district where uh, you have available um, incentives and subsidies to, to do uh, private development. Uh, and we, this area, Atlantic Station, the Beltline, are the major tax allocation districts in, in the city. Now, let me just for a moment tell you why we're looking at the map and why what is really guiding all this growth. 
Uh, two years ago, along with the mayor's office, we conducted an extensive urban planning process called Imagine Downtown, which is uh, you see on these maps. And it, the process has really set the stage for many changes, not only in the last uh, 12 months, but really for the next 10 years. Our mission was really simple. It was, it was focused. We were trying to uh, invite participation, involvement from everybody as we planned out specific areas of downtown uh, for development, and not only that, the type of development that we wanted, which is very critical. Uh, we, we broke the downtown area into five neighborhoods, and then we prioritized where we felt like our precious capital dollars and the capital dollars of the city uh, and our other uh, government organiz organizations should be spent on infrastructure that could help spur development. Um, and many of the projects from Imagine Downtown that you're looking at on your map have started, uh, and some have been completed. Probably the most notable is the Ivan Allen Boulevard Road, which was done uh, from West Peachtree Street down here to Lucky Street, which opened the door the, so folks could get into the aquarium in the coming world of Coke. It also had a lot to do with spurring development around this, this corridor on Centennial Hill. Uh, the second phase of this project will begin towards the end of this year and will uh, connect Lucky Street over the North Side Drive. And many people have asked, you know, why did we, why do we have to do this? Well, interesting enough, it was before the aquarium. Uh, those of you who've been over the Congress Center know that the, really the front door of the Congress Center has now shifted to North Side Drive. And uh, there is no easy way for people who stay in the major hotels up here, about 5,000 rooms, to get to this front door. So this road had been on the, 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 the planning uh, documents for a long time, but it took really the coming of the aquarium to, to actually get it done. So now, though, we'll have this, we have this, we're going to have this really nice east-west access, not only for folks coming to the park, but for folks who are coming um, from the hotel district, but also people who access downtown from Northside Drive. It's a heck of a lot more convenient. The next thing you're going to see, hopefully in the next uh, 30 days, is a whole new wayfinding signage program. And I, there may be a couple of examples on one side of those maps. Uh, we haven't had new signs in downtown Atlanta in, uh, we think, 50 years. And uh, believe it or not, if you, if you come downtown, you see some of these same old signs, some of them brown that advertise the Omni, which uh, is gone about 10 years ago. Um, but, you know, we have brown signs, we have green signs, we have all kinds of things that people post on, uh, on light poles. Uh, believe it or not, we have $3 million worth of signs coming between downtown and Midtown. And Midtown, for the first time, believe, is, is going to have a sign. There's no sign that says now that you're, you're in Midtown. So they will have a lot of signs. And we hope that the Buckhead community, after they see uh, the success of our signage program, will, will be bringing new signs to Buckhead as well in the future. We're also working on streetscape improvements, as is Midtown and as is Buckhead. Uh, our major program involves Marietta Street, uh, which we're going to start here in the next, um, by the end of the year, we're redoing, we're going to redo Marietta Street. We're going to redo this little street called Simpson Street, which runs down to the entrance of the world of Coke. We're redoing Piedmont uh, over here to Decatur Street so that all these students in, at Georgia State will be able to come over here and access Decatur Street, which will be the main campus of Georgia State. And now we've un, uh, uh, embarked on a new design. We don't have the capital dollars yet for Peachtree Street literally down here from underground all the way up Peachtree, past Crawford Long um, to North Avenue. Now all of this uh, growth in the public infrastructure work really is a convergence of some, some key factors. And uh, many of you have been in the community a long time and know that from time to time in Atlanta you have some good things and some bad things happening. And, and uh, usually we have We've grown a, a city in a, an incredibly thriving metropolitan area despite lots of problems either in one sector of, of the community or another. Uh, sometimes it's political leadership, but one of the reasons why we're doing so well now is we have great leadership at City Hall. And, uh, and it's not great only in the fact that our mayor and, and our city council folks are actually are tackling difficult problems like sewer and homelessness and issues like that, 
but they're, in, in my opinion, they're setting a standard by which whoever is mayor next is going to have a hard time not living up to. And we haven't had that in, in quite some time. The other thing that we've been able to convince this administration and that which she has, uh, at least in this second term, has in, in really embarked on is a real commitment to economic development. Uh, Atlanta has grown, the city and the metro area, despite having really the city not being in the economic development business. Well, this mayor uh, sees this as really a linchpin of her legacy here. There is a, 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 for the first time, the city has an economic development plan uh, and it is being implemented. And there's people and resources committed to do that. Uh, and again, I think this, this is something that other cities have been doing for quite some time. And it really bodes well for our downtown community, particularly. There's a lot of euphoria, as you know, from the, the attractions, the aquarium, the new world of Coca-Cola. Uh, we, that kind of euphoria we have every about once every 10, 15 years. We had it when the first underground was around. We had it when the second underground came. We had it from the Olympics. And now we have it from uh, perhaps, you know, a fish tank. But the fact of the matter is the, the, the aquarium is doing extremely well and has set a standard again for um, Atlanta, not only for our community, but really around the world. Uh, the, the amount of people and coverage that the aquarium is getting has again put Atlanta back on the map as a place uh, to come to. I mentioned the infrastructure and incentives um, that are occurring all at the same time. I mentioned Georgia State and, and Georgia Tech too expanding. Uh, Georgia Tech is coming this way, uh, west and east, and Georgia State is kind of west and east and north, and so we're all kind of in here in the CBD benefiting from, from that growth. And then probably the most important thing that's happening is, is folks like, like Jim and others are leading our, our community into high-density housing. And uh, downtown um, has, has, has begun to get its share of this new lifestyle uh, product that Atlanta has never never seen before. And um, I think that our demographics in downtown, which is primarily young people and empty nesters in terms of residents, is, is well poised for uh, this product to continue. And then once downtown gets discovered, I think we'll uh, will continue to attract our share of this rapidly growing type of development. And lastly, all of this has occurred uh, in the last 24 months or 36 months in a period of time where we've had a generally good real estate cycle and that uh, development has, uh, is booming all over the metro area and it's, we've been able to take advantage of a lot of that, uh, that good cycle. So uh, is Imagine Downtown important, and is all this growth important? Uh, is it really relevant uh, to all of you who, who are in the metro area and, and, and beyond? And let me, of course, I'll say yes and, uh, to both questions. And let me, let me tell you why uh, I think that's uh, so, uh, particularly about downtown. Uh, simply put, I think downtown Atlanta is the original DNA of our community. Uh, it's what we are, it's what w where we came from, and, and, why, and it, it explains why Atlanta. No place else in this metro area do you have the coming together of black, white, Asian, Indian. Every ethnicity is represented in downtown Atlanta. It's, it's our past, it's our present, and it's a big part of our future. Downtown is sanitation workers, educators, residents, corporate leaders, secretaries, bureaucrats, taxi cab drivers, sports fanatics, school kids, homeless people, the haves, the have-nots, the wannabes, and the hope-to-bes. Uh, downtown is conservative, Catholic, left-wing, Rastafarian, young, old, and everything in between. It's the only place, in my opinion, in the entire region that collectively we exist and seek on a daily basis a harmony of cultures, philosophies, and lifestyles. Now some in the metro area run from this type of diversity. I mean, I'm, I have to be honest with you, a lot of people don't like diversity in the metro area. But, a down, but around downtown we actually celebrate it. 
It's because we know that what's happening downtown today, with all its pluses and it's all its minuses, is mostly likely going to happen to the rest of the metro area in the years to come. And if you don't think so, uh, you have, if you can just think about what's happening around in Gwinnett County, in Cobb County, and other counties where they're struggling with infrastructure problems and crime issues and other issues, all of this metro area, in my opinion, is going to look like downtown Atlanta in our lifetime. So we're somewhat of a, uh, a, a an experiment, if you may, if, if, if as people look to what happened downtown, uh, look to their areas in the future. At, at Central Atlanta Progress, we like to think of ourselves as the kind of the stewards of this original DNA and the future it holds. Uh, and what we do, we have to look beyond the specific mission, particularly a short-term mission, to accomplish this long-term goal. We, we like to forecast, understand, adapt, and deal with things that kind of transcend, transcend the, the immediate focus. And the issues are, that we face are extremely complex. And when I say we, I'm including all of you uh, here in, in, in Atlanta. Um, how each of us speaks about downtown, or any area for that matter, and thinks about downtown has an impact on the rest of the region. Uh, I'll give you some examples. Does impacting homelessness have any effect on economic development? And I would tell you yes. Does attracting new business have an impact, impact on education? I would say yes. Does reducing crime affect families and children? Of course. Does funding affordable housing help build our workforce? Yes. Does adding green space increase the quality of life? Yes. Does stopping panhandling affect a person's willingness to invest in buildings? Does increasing literacy, literacy affect job creation? The point is simply is this. Each and every challenge and asset that downtown has belongs to all of us in some way, either directly or indirectly. And each and every challenge and asset that downtown has impacts the entire metro area, how it's viewed, how it's perceived. In some respects, we are the brand. Believe, believe it or not, we are the brand of Atlanta. A lot of people don't recognize that when, when people think of Atlanta, they think of downtown Atlanta. <coughs> and surely, as downtown's challenges are not addressed, damage is done to the brand uh, in the whole region. And our mayor has said it many times, and uh, we like to say it as well, that we'll never be that shining light on the hill uh, that most cities in our city aspire to be unless we have a great downtown. So here we are today with a lot, lots of opportunities, uh, and there's great hope uh, that through our collective abilities we'll bring change to our community no matter what our individual missions call for. It, and again, it may not be ours in this generation to complete this task, but neither are we free to uh, ignore it. And so whether you live in downtown or not, whether you work in downtown or not, whether you visit downtown or not, uh, somehow all, all the DNA of, of, of all of you is part of us. Uh, and therefore, you're important to downtown's existence, and downtown is important to you and to our future. And earlier I asked you to imagine about downtown. To some degree, the answers to all that imagining is within each of us and our organizations. And um, I'll stop there and be glad to take questions about any of that that uh, I mentioned before. Thank you very much. AJ. Yes. And use the microphone. I was supposed to remind you all to do Thank yes. you. Thanks, Jim. Ten years ago, <laughs> CAP addressed the issue of homelessness with a major study, and since then we've had legislation, we've had Horace Sibley, we've had a new facility, but Pine Street still bustles every day with uh, the number of people. What, what is the next step in trying to address that problem? Well, uh, Jim's referring to work that CAP did 10 years ago, and most recently um, Horace Sibley has a, a task force that uh, was appointed by the mayor and it really did a great job and came up with like 28 things to do in terms of solving chronic homelessness in our community, which is about 10 to 12,000 people. Uh, and 
the, the, uh, it's really interesting, again, uh, I, the, I'll quote the mayor, that when you think about 10 to 12,000 people who are, are chronically homeless, the mayor says this lots of times, if we can build the busiest airport in the world, if we can bring the Olympics here, uh, if we can have four and a half million people living in Atlanta in pretty, in pretty good shape, we ought to be able to figure out what to do about 10 to 12,000 people. And that's really the focus of Horace's commission. Now, they've begun to implement a lot of, uh, uh, of that report, one of which is the creation of the Gateway Center, um, which is down uh, next to, is in the old city jail and converted, which is doing quite well. The, the, real, the theory is this, Jim, that the, Atlanta has traditionally done a very good job, believe it or not, of taking care of homeless people. We, we, we feed them. We have lots of shelters. Uh, we actually do pretty good. But no city, and particularly us, have done a good job of getting people out of being homeless. Uh, we, we're, we're, and that's what this Homeless Commission is all about. And a lot of that is, uh, Horace talks about the front door and the back door. You've got to first get the folks in. You have to process them. You have to get them their med medication. You've got to get them a job. You, you have to re reunite them with their families. And all of this work of the commission, uh, is that's what this commission is about. It's trying to collectively bring together everybody that's doing parts of this on the fringes. Um, and you mentioned the, the Pine Street Shelter, which is right here on Peachtree, which is a uh, problematic only because uh, it's overcrowded and like, people spill out into the street. If you talk to Her Horace, his long-term mission really is to, is to be in a city where you don't have homeless shelters. Uh, he, and so he'll tell you that 10 years from now, there won't be any shelters. Now, that, I'd like to believe Horace, and, and perhaps it's true, but he'll tell you the real secret to, to, to solving that issue is housing. And part of his work, and the, what you, we haven't seen yet, is the, the, the fruit of that work is finding housing for homeless people. There's a, there was an article, I think last week in the New York Times or Wall Street Journal, is specifically about this subject, is that cities, and ours included, are now saying, look at all the resources that we're spending on homeless, trying to get people out of being homeless. What we really ought to do is just give them housing. Just give it to them. It's cheaper. It's more effective. It's, it gets them off the street and gets them in a place of dignity. So part, a big chunk of our, this commission is about housing. And you're going to see some of that coming out pretty soon because from, a, from nowhere, a three years ago, the city and Horace now have $40 million to play with from city resources and, and, the, and the donor community. And you're going to see a real commitment to housing homeless people being rolled out in the next couple of years. So I hope when you ask that question 10 years from now, uh, we won't be talking about the Pine Street Shelter, but we may. Um, but it is a great experiment. Any other questions? Yes, I, I want you to use the mic. I'm, yes. I'm involved with the Trinity House, which is a private approach to it. When we take drug treatment or people or people out of prison that are serious, we have our alumni involved in screening them. And um, we're seeing a, a large increase in applicants, and a lot of them are from New Orleans area. And um, we're wondering if there is some kind of federal assistance available to help these people. We're, we're following them all the way through, but the scope is so much bigger than our problem. And I'm just wondering, what is the mayor doing about attracting federal dollars? I look at cities like Chattanooga that are redeveloped, and a lot of it didn't come from just the taxpayers. It came from uh, federal, dollars. federal dollars coming in. And, and are we good at doing that? Because that's going to be some huge money. Uh, we've stepped up regionally to bring a lot of these people in from New Orleans, and they're going to need help. Yeah. Now, that's a very good question. I mean, I think we, from my observation, I would we we uh, we're responsible for Woodruff Park now, which has a lot of, uh, on a daily basis, a lot of homeless pat wash in and out. And we've also noticed an increase, and I think it is from uh, New Orleans. And uh, again, part of this commission uh, work is to is to try to access federal dollars. And I and I think everybody would admit that up until a couple years ago, uh, we weren't we weren't good at it. I think they're getting better at it, but as you know, you got to get in line for federal dollars. You have to, uh, you have to jump through the hoops. 
And th this is, a, again, a unique issue. The, technically, the city of Atlanta is not responsible for homeless issues. I mean, technically, it's Fulton County it, that, that, that flows down county money flowing from the state. And this, this mayor decided, you know, this isn't, it isn't enough, and she took this project on. So uh, we hadn't had that type of leadership uh, in the past. So I think we're going to have to give them, give them some time. But uh, I, as I understand it, and I'm not an expert on exactly what they're doing, a big piece of this is getting in line for federal dollars. And I hope, I'm hopefully they'll be successful. Scott, go ahead. Or and, and you got the microphone, go Andy. Go ahead. Hey, Jake, uh, can you share with us what the demographics are for Underground Atlanta currently? Where where the patrons such as they are coming from? And then the follow-up is what's your prognosis uh, for underground. I'm old enough to remember yeah. drinking at the bucket shops. So. Right. Well, uh, I, I, you know, that, um, that that's a good question. I mean, underground, a, again, back to the original underground, if people remember it kind of created itself. Uh, then we had some uh, crime issues. It was shut down. Then we, uh, back in the 80s, we redid underground and because we needed to. We needed um, we needed to provide some place for all this convention business to go to. And the city, uh, with help from the private sector, redid it. In retrospect, we probably did two things wrong in, that, in the redo. One is we didn't make it big enough, I think, because it was, it's constrained by those underground streets. And some of the real issues, once it was open, were not underground itself, but everything around underground. So the experience of getting to underground was what people didn't like, having to go through the MARTA station or or walking down streets that didn't look safe. Uh, and we tried to really turn it into a retail mall. And uh, I think, in, again, in retrospect, that wasn't exactly the right retail in the sense of being entertainment. Uh, we probably should have just stuck to entertainment like the original underground. So now what, what's occurred, uh, what's occurring is that the folks who are managing underground now have kind of tried to take it back to their, its roots of being an entertainment venue with some success. Uh, I can't tell you that it's outstanding success, but they have opened a number of, of nighttime entertainment venues. We've got a police station in there. It, it, it's, it's clean. It's, it's, it's safe. Uh, the less you actually you hear about underground, the better, because the only thing that you will ever hear is that some, of some, some that the paper will write about is something that's bad that's happened there. So. On some levels, it's succeeding. I, I think that we can do a lot better, personally. Uh, now that we have new entertainment around the park, um, I think it's probably a good time to take a, a fresh look at underground, and not only underground, but this whole corridor that runs from literally the state capitol over, uh, over through the gulch and somehow connecting over here to Centennial Olympic Park, because I think now we have the density of visitors to try to pull these visitors down over here. And of course, we have Georgia State booming all around underground. So I think the city is, interesting enough, is still on the hook on the bonds for underground. I think they're, they're, it's something like um, six to eight million dollars a year. And if we actually think about that, are we actually getting our money's worth from as a, as a taxpayer? So I think in the, in the um, months to come, we've been talking to the city about looking at that whole corridor, particularly because the world of Coke is going to move uh, to the north side of the park. And uh, Georgia State's growing like a weed. And, and can we do something that would enhance that whole corridor? Another big part of it, and this is, again, just my personal opinion, everybody uh, has their opinion about MARTA which, uh, whether you like it or not, MARTA carries almost 500,000 people a day. Uh, and it isn't going anywhere, and a lot of people depend on it for their livelihood. In my humble opinion, if, if MARTA, until MARTA deals with the Five Points MARTA station, which is a, a, this kind of concrete bunker that if you're running a business, it, it just doesn't seem to be the right brand that you would want people to, re to remember about your business. If it's this, you, you, it's a sort of foreboding thing to go inside the, the Marta station. I think we have such an opportunity there to 
to be more aspirational as a, as in terms of what that station ought to look like and feel and people touch it. And if we can combine something like that, and we've been talking to Marta about that, about helping them with that exercise, and then relate that all to the corridor of underground and what we can do and incorporate Georgia State. I mean, one of, one of the ideas is to take all those students who are living um, in those Georgia State dorms and, and figure out a place to put them right on top of underground. And uh, now that would change the character. We'll have to figure out the character of that, that retail mix there. But uh, I would say we, there, we, we've got, a, there's an opportunity there in the next two to three years with this mayor to really, uh, to really look at it again. Scott, you had a question? Yes. Yeah, uh, I think what's unique in the city of Atlanta and right on its outskirts right now is that downtown's going through this whole renovation. So is Midtown, so is Buckhead. Right. Recently in Las Vegas, representatives from each organization accompanied the mayor and preached the city and really right. tried to promote it. Talk to me about your relationship with Susan, with Scotty Green, uh, Midtown Buckhead Alliance, what you work on together, although you each have your separate agenda, so maybe what you're not no, letting them know. Believe it or not, we work a lot uh, together. The, uh, in, in, in some respects, and those of you who've been in the real estate business uh, recognize this, is that um, downtown Atlanta, if you live north of Buckhead, everything is downtown Atlanta. People refer to, you, you know, if you live, right, downtown is Buckhead Inn. I mean, everybody, it's only in these three submarkets, or if you live in town, that you refer to it as these three different real estate submarkets. And and again, if you get up in a very tall building, you'll recognize that downtown from a commercial standpoint is literally Peachtree Street from this area to where we are sitting here today. I mean, it's office buildings and folks are spread all up and down the Peachtree Corridor. And the people in Buckhead, Scotty Green, Sam Massell, Susan Mendham and Midtown, we all recognize that, that this corridor is really and is really our commercial center. We don't call it downtown Atlanta, but that's really, it all used to be you know, right here. At one time and then it just spread, spread up Peachtree Street. Now, you're, it's two or three streets wide in, in some places, but it, it really pretty much, that's what, that's what the community is. So literally, uh, uh, a couple years ago, we all decided that for the, the health and welfare, not only of Atlanta, but really the whole region and the whole state, this is the most, successful uh, visible corridor in the state. It's the highest tax paying area. It's where most of the wealth of the state of Georgia is. And we, and if you think about it, we really haven't done much to enhance this corridor, except develop, private developers building buildings. So we agreed um, that in our tenures, in our positions, that really what we needed to do was enhance the experience of Peachtree Street. Uh, again, most people, who come to Atlanta, all want to go to Peachtree Street, and when they come, they're somewhat uh, underwhelmed by the experience. If you compare it to, say, Michigan Avenue or Fifth Avenue or pick any great street in the world and, and compare it to Peachtree. So we've been on this kind of mission and, and together that if we can somehow make the Peachtree Street experience, and when I talk about Peachtree Street, it's you know, two or three streets wide, uh, but primarily Peachtree Street, that if we together can, uh, come up, can come up with ideas that would enhance the connectivity, the transportation, the look, the aesthetic, the experience, then, then we've accomplished that task of kind of growing these things together. And I'll, I'll say this, particularly between downtown and midtown, there is no particular reason why there's a separation of downtown and midtown. There's, uh, you know, we even created this new neighborhood called Sono, which we're downtown and midtown Midtown meet, um, but there's not that much delineation. I live in Midtown, right in the shadows of, of uh, uh, Colony Square, and there's just not a whole lot of difference once you get into the Peachtree Corridor here. So I think to answer your question, I think now we've gotten some traction. We got a Peachtree Corridor Task Force that's chaired by Tom Bell. Uh, they're looking at everything in the corridor, which is good. Uh, we're all working on uh, improvements to Peachtree Street itself. Uh, those in Buckhead are starting real soon. Um, Midtown started theirs, and we're 
Uh, we're the last because we actually had done a lot of work prior to the Olympics, so we had some other priorities. So I think you're going to see in the future a lot of, uh, of uh, things that connect these submarkets, and in the end, I think they are going to look uh, a lot about. I mean, Andy asked about demographics. Uh, the city now has a, a great presentation that the Development Authority does that shows these two million people that are going to move to the metro area, even if we don't do anything by 2020 or 2025, those two million people are mainly um, empty nesters or becoming empty nesters, baby boomers who are, who are going to be empty nesters, or they're empty nesters moving here, and they're young people who are coming here to college from Georgia or one of the other great institutions, and they stay here. That demographic is not only downtown's demographic, but it's, it's all of Midtown and, and Buckhead as well. And so where are they going to live? Jim will tell you that they're going to live in a Novair project somewhere up and down Peachtree Street. But they are. They've already started in your projects. And I think it's just going to continue. And if we make this experience in this Peachtree Corridor extremely livable, like you can go out and you know, walk down the street and take your kid to school or, or go to the grocery or do what you do in a normal kind of big big city, then we're going to capture more than those those two million that are coming to the metro area. So uh, it's a great challenge. It's a great concept. And of course, the city not only is looking at this now, but they're also looking at the Beltline as an, another opportunity for uh, affordable housing and other things. So uh, it's a great time to be um, I think working on all these projects, and we do work a lot together. Yes, sir. Some time ago, I was told that the Lords of London had predicted that Atlanta was destined to be the largest city in the world someday. And the, and the question, because it can grow in all directions. Right. And the question in my mind, do you think there's available water and sewage facilities to, to permit such a thing? Well, the sewage is a, the sewage is a more, is an easier question because I think that's one that has been uh, dealt with. I mean, we are all uh, are paying extra taxes and the mayor, uh, you know, we've got this $3 billion that we're putting in the sewer system. So I'm, I'm pretty confident that the, the sewer capacity is there and will be there because we are, it's, it's a new state-of-the-art program uh, that we had to obviously do because we were under a consent decree to do it, but uh, I'm convinced on sewage that we'll, we'll get there. On the, um, on the water, the water is a big issue not only for Atlanta but for the whole state, and uh, there's a lot of folks working on this, this issue. Uh, the Atlanta Chamber is, is at the forefront of the of the issue from a metro area standpoint. Uh, there's lots of issues with other parts of Georgia, and there's lots of issues with other states. Uh, there, we're in lawsuits with Florida and Alabama over the, the, the Chattahoochee and where, all, where the, the Chattahoochee flows. So um, that's an issue that's, gonna, that's got a lot of politics tied to it, but it's critical. I mean, you, you're, you're seeing more and more of it in our uh, our press writing about it, that water is critical, particularly in these, these days where there's no rain and you see issues with Lake Lanier uh, levels and um, so forth. So and if, if there's this one thing that people talk about that can really impede growth in the area, it's, it's the lack of water. And it's something that we really have to get our hands around. Yes. A AJ, I, what is the status on the uh, talked about free shuttle that would run downtown and link the high with uh, MLK with the aquarium? Okay, that, that's a great question. We, we have been advocating in the downtown community a, some type of shuttle system that would run around downtown from the aquarium. We have all these people who are uh, coming to the aquarium, and I'm sure you all have experienced this, where you come in and you park at the aquarium, you walk around Lucky Street with nobody had ever been on in their lives, and and you come in the aquarium, and then, and you don't not sure what to do, so you just go back along Lucky Street and get in your car and you and you go back to where you came from, 
and like, kind of like a Braves game or a Falcons game. And we are, de we are just determined that we want to get some of those folks to circulate around the rest of the community. So we have been advocating a, sh a free shuttle that would circulate um, around downtown and also come over here to the King Center because there's a million people who visit the King Center area on a yearly basis and then go up here to the hotel district. Well, we hadn't quite figured out the funding yet, but in the meantime, I think because we've been talking about it so much, we've had Marta stepped up and introduced a sh two shuttles. Uh, but I'm not, they just started a couple of weeks ago, but it's a shuttle that it literally comes all the way up here to under, it's called the Tourist Loop or the ATL. And it goes over here to Boulevard and it comes up to Midtown, the Atlantic Station, it comes around. Problem is it's running every 30 minutes you pay $1.75, and it takes you a long time to get where you need to go. Now, they're also introduced a sh uh, extended a bus line from here down to the zoo because they felt like there was some, there's a lot of traffic between there. This is great, and I wish Martin all the success in the world, but I don't think it, it solves our issue, which is trying to get people from the aquarium over to CNN, to Underground, the King Center, Hotel District, and do it in, a, in an efficient way. So we're co continuing to work on our program. Now, at the same time, a, a private uh, individual has come out in the last 30 days, and he's running these kind of uh, trolley cars, They're, but it's a whole different function. He's trying to make it a fun thing. You get on the trolley and you ride around downtown and kind of in a party atmosphere, and it's, it's circulating around downtown in these old uh, vehicles. He's only got three of them, though, so I'm not, I'm not quite sure how long he's going to last, and he also is charging uh, I think $1.75 to do that. So to answer your question, we're not there yet, but I do think as particularly as we get, as we approach the opening of the world of Coke, um, that we're continuing to try to figure out how do we circulate people around because the worst thing in the world for us would be is people who come, park, get in their car here, and then they decide, oh, I want to go to, over to see the CNN tour, which attracts 400,000 people a year. And they get in their car and they come over here and park at CNN. And then they say, well, I want to go to the King Center. And then they get in their car and they go over here to the King Center. I mean, that, that's just crazy. Um, so we're trying to figure out the dynamics of, that, of, that, uh, of all these visitors who are coming and how do we get them around. And, and again, someone mentioned Chattanooga, uh, Charlotte. All, other cities have figured that out. We're just not quite there yet. And I think we will be hopefully soon. Okay, I'm, get, I'm getting the <laughs> cut sign. Thank you very much. Thank you. AJ, I'll keep you up here for a, a minute. We've got a couple awards or uh, Award. gifts for you. I didn't win anything yet. This is a, uh, a Terry College paint can, and uh, Great. it's actually got a golf shirt in there, and it's uh, a Terry Third Thursday a golf shirt that only speakers at the Terry Third Thursday have, so uh, we hope you'll enjoy that. And then we also have a nice piece of crystal. So I guess I can't sell this on eBay if it's only <laughs> one of a kind. And I'm going to keep the crystal in the bag because it's well packaged. But okay. uh, we w again want to thank you thank for you uh, coming to be our speaker this morning. A um, couple uh, reminders uh, to get out of the garage free. Just tell them Terry Third Thursday, uh, July 20th, Clean the Air Campaign. Hope you'll uh, join us and bring a friend. And uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>